Okay, class, welcome back. In this unit, we'll be covering congenital cardiac disorders. So the objectives for this series of lectures, we'll be covering the normal embryology and fetal blood flow. Again, just the basics. This is not a pediatrics course. This is also not an embryology course. We'll get into congenital defects, some of the more common ones you might see in practice. We'll get into the medical management, so just have a, an understanding of how these cases will be managed from the medical side and surgical side, and then the physical therapy implications. And we'll have a little bit of discussion on the relationship between cardiac defects and developmental disabilities, which is where these typically manifest or how these conditions often manifest in terms of, of clinical practice. So uh, just again, this is not a an embryology course, it's not a pediatrics specialty course, but we'll cover over some basic timelines. Uh, just remembering that the cardiovascular system, like pretty much everything else in your body, develops from the involution and folding um, of, of different tubes of, of the germ layers. The cardiovascular system arises from the mesodermal germ layer um, and uh, basically forms from the, the folding of two uh, simple epithelial tubes, right? So we've got kind of this, this, this picture here. The big takeaway is uh, at about one month or three to four weeks, we see these tubes fuse to form what will become the, the heart, right? So we uh, form this very primitive early a single chambered heart at about one month. And if you look on an ultrasound in a child at about one month, uh, that is when you will start to see the heart beating. So at about one month, we have a single chambered uh, heart. And then um, again, like everything else in your body through embryological develop development, we have folding and twisting um, to form different parts of our bodies. Um, so the next major landmark would be at week eight. So about two months, we start to see the formation of what will look like the, uh, the four chambered hearts. So the two atria, the two ventricles will form at about, uh, two months or, or eight weeks. So again, major takeaway that the heart, just like everything else forms from the folding of germ layers, you create tubes, these tubes form, um, <clears throat> And at one month, we have the single chambered heart. So we start seeing the heart beat at four, four weeks, one month. And then at two week, two months, eight weeks, we start to see the four chambered heart. Um, and then we start seeing the remainder of the valves, uh, notably the semilunar valves, are completed by week nine. So at about two months, the, the structure of the heart as we know it is, to, is about formed. And there's an example of kind of what we see here. Um, in the, the fetus here. So here's the heart, roughly again, that primitive one month heart, again, single chambered at about day 26 or one month. So key things to remember that when the, the baby or the child or the fetus is growing in its mother's womb during pregnancy, they are completely dependent, completely dependent on their mother for blood flow. So the fetus receives oxygenated blood from the placenta, um, and the blood goes back into circulation from the child, uh, from, you know, from the, from the fetus, uh, through the umbilical vein, right? So, uh, this is important to remember. We'll get into later on that, like anything the mother consumes will be passed on the child because the child is, is, you know, getting all its blood supply from the mother, um, and all the oxygenation from the mother. So, there are a couple key differences in the uh, fetal circulation or fetal blood flow. So we've got these two structures, the ductus arteriosus, which we can see here, and the foramen ovale, which we can't really picture here, but which would be uh, between the two atria. We can't really see it in this picture, uh, but it would be located somewhat here. Uh, the purpose of these two structures really is to help redirect blood um, away from the lungs, right? So what ends up happening is as the right ventricle pumps, right? Again, our lungs are typically developing a little bit later. Um, and they, you know, typically we start seeing surfactant, for example, develop, which is a crucial, crucial substance in the lungs, develop it around uh, week 28. Um, which is far later than, again, that week week eight, where we start seeing the pumping of the heart. Um, so we, we want to give the lungs time to develop, and we don't really need them, right? 
um, because again, we're getting that perfusion from mom. So uh, the foramen ovale, the ductus arteriosus help um, shunt blood away, the ductus arteriosus uh, notably. So again, as the right ventricle pumps, this ductus arteriosus will you know, shunt some of that blood um, actually into the aorta um, to move it away from going down to the pulmonary veins, sorry, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary capillaries into the lungs. That can the, the, the protect them. Um, fortunately, the ductus arteriosus is typically distal to the three main branches of the uh, aorta. So this allows the brain to still develop normal oxygenation, which the brain needs to develop in utero. Um, so again, ductus arteriosus is really there to help shunt blood away from the lungs. So allow them to develop and where it's placed, we still allow the brain to get normal oxygenation. The foramen ovale allows for that, you know, rich oxygenated blood from the placenta, right, to travel into the left ventricle. So again, we're not pumping and oxygenating our own blood through our lungs because we're in, you know, we're in utero. So the foramen ovale allows us to move that blood from the right, from the from the placenta, as you see here, right, into the left chamber to get out to the brain and to the periphery, right? We're gonna have a little bit, bit of mixing here because of the ductus arteriosus. But again, this allows us to receive oxygenated blood from mom to get into the left circuit through the foramen ovale. Let me just clean this up here again. Right, so the foramen ovale allows us, again, think of there's gonna be a hole between these two sides. As blood enters through the placenta, Right, we're gonna end up passing through the foramen ovale into the left ventricle, pumping out of the left ventricle into the aorta, right, to go to the brain, right? And then, you know, distally to the periphery. In, uh, you know, and this is important because when the right ventricle pumps, right, we shunt blood away from it, right, um, away from the lungs, right, because we're not perfusing, we're not, there's no, there's no oxygen going into our lungs. So the foramen ovale allows us to receive oxygenated blood, the ductus arteriosus prevents uh, blood and perfusion and, you know, you know, flow from getting into the lungs, allow them to develop. Both of these things go away um, and fold and destroy themselves, um, the involute as we're born and start needing to use our lungs. Um, however, we'll get into some conditions where they are still patent, but normally in fetal blood flow, these, these are actually really important, again, for allowing the lungs to develop, as well as for us for receiving oxygenated blood. Um, so again, fetal blood flow completely dependent on mom. If you haven't thanked your mom already, make sure to do so. Um, a couple of th key things you might also notice is that um, fetal blood flow is typically a little bit lower in oxygen, uh, oxygen, tension, so PaO2 is a little bit lower. However, oxygen concentration is actually a little bit higher because the fetal hemoglobin actually has a little bit higher affinity for, for oxygen um, than you know, adult blood. So um, moving on here, so to congenital defects. Uh, these typically occur at birth um, as some sort of, of failure of normal development of the cardiovascular system. There's at least 15 types of defects that have been identified. There's probably more now um, and even rarer forms. Um, and it's usually some sort of abnormal opening between the adjacent heart chambers, right? So between the ventricles, the atria, the, the valves, or the great vessels. So it's either something that is open, that shouldn't be open, something that's closed, that shouldn't be closed. That's, a, that's the best way to think about it. They're actually fairly common, um, or more common than, me, than, than most um, congenital malformations. In fact, they're about present in about one out of, out of 100 births. Some of them are a little bit more severe. Some of them are pretty benign, and some of them, you know, need surgery. And some of them will kind of will kind of uh, correct on their own. We'll get into some of those uh, later on. Um, the infant death rate, right, still pretty concerning. About thirty-eight um, for in Caucasian uh, uh, kids, fifty-six percent or fifty-six out of hundred thousand in African American. There's definitely definitely some social determinants um, influencing that, especially access to prenatal care, because some of the biggest causes for congenital uh, cardiac defects would be uh, viral infections, um, teratogen exposure, or you know, inadequate access to prenatal care. Um, and again, 
whatever the mother is eating, whatever the state the mother is in, is going to pass on to the child. So that's why it's so important that mothers have access to um, this type of care because it's going to it's going to pass on to the baby. Um, but obviously, there are some hereditary defects that um, may, may 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 be related here, as well as some genetic defects that may uh, both affect. Um, the cardiovas cardiovascular system, as well as neurocognitive development, like Down syndrome. We'll get into the, how that relationship plays out. So the thing that I want you guys to bear in mind, again, is remember the normal blood flow, uh, normal flow of blood throughout the heart, and then think of how it changes in that normal pattern of blood flow and how that may affect function, how that may affect pumping performance of the heart, and then exercise capacity, and how that may affect development, right? If a kid has a weak heart or heart that's not effective, it's going to be kind of hard to move, right? And if they can't move, kids, you know, learn by playing. And if they can't move, they can't play, they can't explore their environment, they, it's going to affect their learning. Um, even if there isn't some sort of direct, you know, change to the you know, ner nervous system, um, there may be secondary consequences or extrinsic consequences just from the heart itself um, not being as efficient. So again, there's a very strong association with congenital heart defects and developmental disorders. Um, children with congenital heart defects are at increased risk of developmental disorders, disabilities, or delay. You'll learn more about the three, three differences. These aren't exactly the same thing, um, even though they sound very similar, disorders, disabilities, or delay. Again, this is not a PEDS course. You'll learn plenty about that. There are some intrinsic causes, some of them being genetic. So there are you know, some of the same some of the same genetic changes that may lead to a neurocognitive uh, disorder or disability may also change uh, or have effects on the cardiovascular system, most notably Down syndrome. Um, we see these, you know, it's the same genes that are changed um, affect the cardiovascular system. It's quite often that kids with Down syndrome have a congenital heart defect um, or some sort of changes to their vascular system. We see this as well in, um, I believe, in cystic uh, uh, cerebral palsy as well. Poor perfusion during the prenatal period. Again, so cardiovascular change is intrinsic, like there's some damage uh, to, the, to the, the nervous system, right? Or pediatric stroke, right? So it's a cardiovascular condition directly affecting you know, neurocognitive or neurocognitive development because a kid had a stroke. Um, and then there are extrinsic causes. So again, surgery, like just being on a bypass machine, going through all the the controlled trauma of surgery when you're, you know, a, a baby. Impaired socialization. Unfortunately, kids are kids are pretty cruel um, and, and almost xenophobic. Like if a kid has something that's different um, or maybe they can't keep up with their friends, um, they, they, they run the risk of not being brought into to peer groups, um, being bullied or ostracized, and that, that's going to affect their development. Environmental stressors. While we've, we've made great strides and efforts in improving the, the living conditions for babies in the neonatal intensive care unit. It's just not the same as being around your, your, your mother and father, your parents, um, you know, developing quiet, you know, warm, comfortable room. It's just different. And then impaired capacity to explore their environment. Again, kids learn by playing, by exploring their environment. That's what you'll learn about in pediatrics. Like, why it's so important for kids to get them moving so they can kind of develop. Um, it's really, really important. So neurodevelopmental uh, disability affects about 50% of uh, infants undergoing interventions for congenital heart disease. It's very common. Patients with complex cardiac diseases more likely to have social functioning issues because of the neurocognitive impairments as well as maybe social ostracization from their peer groups. Um, you know, the kids with Down syndrome, have, they have these changes to sympathetic um, nervous system outflow. And um, the, the bigger concern is that, you know, for many years, unfortunately, kids with uh, neurocognitive disorders or uh, significant cardiac defects, um, specific cardiac defects, would not survive to, ch to, to childhood, right? So these kids with congenital heart defects um, would not survive to, to, you know, to adulthood. However, an increasing number are, and unfortunately, there really hasn't been a, a major champion for these kids in a long, long time. You guys may look into the history of the profession. Uh, Linda Crane was was one, probably the last really big champion um, for this, uh, this these patients, these kids with congenital heart defects 
that have these neurocognitive issues and they have very specific needs. So uh, for, if you're interested, there's, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a special interest group that is um, you know, being created at this very moment between the cardiovascular um, and pulmonary academy of the APTA as well as the pediatric academy because it's, it's a really, really, really um, you know, important population to serve. And again, this is the relationship between um, what we're talking about here. So again, the severity of the complex congenital heart defect, right? We see a greater prevalence of severe impairment. So again, um, if we look, again, moving left to right, mild to moderate, um, in terms of severity of the congenital heart defect, we see a higher, right, increasing higher, higher amount of disabilities. Um, and particularly more severe conditions. Again, some of these are directly related to the same exact genes that are changed, right? Again, Down syndrome is a pretty common one where we see like the same genes are, are affected that affect the brain that may affect, or the nervous system that may affect the, the, the cardiovascular system. Um, but there's also acquired issues here. Um, and again, it's just, there's just different environments, right? Think of the impact of spending your first few weeks in a NICU versus a regular room close to your parents, right? Um, irrespective of the, the status of your impairments or disease or deficits, right? Just being in this situation as a baby, newborn, versus here, close to your parents, hearing their voices. We, we, we learn from, again, not a Pete's therapist, but like there's evidence suggests that like kids like learn, start developing their, their you know, vocal recognition, speech, language from this hearing their parents, right? Like um, bonding with their parents. These things are really important for kids. And again, we've done a lot better now of trying to create quiet hours for kids, limiting the number of noise and uh, making sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're optimizing these environments as best we can. But at the end of the day, it's just not the same. So we'll end here. We'll get into some... Um, statistics on congenital heart defects, as well as um, the medical interventions for these defects.